Good morning, Christian Chapel. Good morning. We are so glad to have you here at Christian Chapel. I'm going to ask you all to stand on your feet this morning. It's so good to see you all. Listen, I'm excited because it is Sunday morning and there is no better place to be than in the house of God. If this is your first time joining us here at Christian Chapel, we want to welcome you home. We're family here. And if you are watching at home online, we want to welcome you as well. Listen, we serve the God of a breakthrough. So if you believe that you need a breakthrough this morning, just know you serve a God that will give you that breakthrough. Come on and worship. Sing your name. 
We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are, we claim your victory. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, let's just begin to praise the Lord this morning. Oh, hallelujah to the King of Kings, oh, to the Lord of Lords. Oh, hallelujah. We look to you as our strength. And this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We pray for you, we pray for you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We pray for you, we pray. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we pray. The God of grace is on our side, forever lift Him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise You. Oh, 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 oh. we praise You. Oh, 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 oh. we praise You. Oh, 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 oh. we praise. Thank you that you are a good God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. Oh 
You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. For I have lived in the good. that's what we're here for today is to remember your faithfulness lord to look back and see all of the moments where you have intervened all the moments where you have provided where you have saved you've delivered you've healed you've done exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask or think or imagine lord we come to declare your faithfulness to you we come to declare your faithfulness to ourselves we come to declare it to each other and lord i pray in these moments that for any person who's come in wondering of your goodness, wondering of your faithfulness, Lord, may our collective testimony assure them that today you are good, today you are faithful, today you are present, and today you are active. Lord, we come before you today. We lay down all of our needs, we lay down all of our doubts, we lay down all of the spaces where we need you and we know it and where we need you and we don't know it. And we pray today that you would be the faithful Father that you would be the present savior, that you would be the empowering spirit. Lord, will you come to us in these moments? Assure us of your presence, assure us of your love, and assure us of your plan. Lord, lift our eyes up from where we are to who you are. Remind us, Lord, that you saw it all coming and you're gonna be with us every step of the way. Lord, we surrender to you as the Lord who provides, as the Lord who saves, as the Lord who delivers. We surrender to you as the Lord who heals. We surrender to you as the Lord who forgives. And Lord, we ask today that what you have done and are doing for us, 
you will continue and you will help us to be part of that same presence in the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel. And whether you are in the room with us or joining us online, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Today's a special Sunday for us at Christian Chapel. We're going to have our, our kids hang out with us for just a few minutes longer than normal. At Christian Chapel, if you've been around uh, more than a couple weeks, you're familiar with our Kingdom Builders giving. Kingdom Builders is how we support what God is doing here in our community and also around the world. Through the global arm of Kingdom Builders, we support over 50 uh, Christian workers and ministries working in 30 nations around the world. We support local initiatives like Royal Family Kids Camp for Children in Foster Care, Crisis Pregnancy Outreach, local elementary school ministry, and we also make next generation investments. So many of us uh, make it our goal each year to give over and above our regular giving to be part of Kingdom Builders. And then every five or six weeks or so, we have one of the, the ministries that we support will come through and check in with us so we can get a, an up-close look at what Kingdom Builders is actually doing around the world. This morning, it's my privilege to uh, reintroduce to some of us and introduce for the first time to others, Greg and Rosanna Schultz. Uh, Greg was on staff at Christian Chapel about six years ago when he was an MDiv student at the Oral Roberts University Seminary. He worked with us in a part-time role as an associate pastor, and then upon completion of that, moved back to the Northwest where he was from and has served in, in different roles there. He and Rosanna, uh, you can stop by the table in the foyer. They can tell you exactly where they're going and what they're doing, uh, but they, are, they have answered the call of God on their life to be part of taking the gospel to new people in new places. And so in just a moment, Greg's going to come and tell us about how they're doing that through one of the uh, Live Dead teams that, that we're supporting. Uh, but as a way of introduction, we've got a short video for you, and then Greg will come up and share with us for a moment. Without a doubt, our world is covered with lost people. The Live Dead focus is on access to the gospel. We go for the single and uniting mission of the church. To bring glory to the name of Jesus among every tribe, nation, and tongue. That is why we live dead. Planting churches, unreached people groups, If you have the Word of God with you this morning, please turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. You see, the Holy Spirit stirs up the evangelist Luke to write a record of eyewitnesses concerning who Jesus is, his life, his death, his resurrection, when Luke himself comes to meet Jesus, the living God, as Lord and Savior, and he does it for this reason, because how can people put their faith in something that they have never heard of? Faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. And so there needs to be an account of the gospel in people's lives in order for that to happen. Actually, every single one of you, if you follow Jesus as Lord this morning, you believe because someone came to you and told you about Jesus. Someone came and told you about the kingdom of God. They told you about the grace and mercy of the Lord, that it didn't matter how terrible and broken you were in the gospel. There is the forgiveness of sin and everlasting life and new life and abundant life in Jesus. I remember the day that I came to know Jesus really well. It was through my sister. My sister was the carrier of the gospel to me. We were raised in a Lutheran home. We were taught the things about God, but I had never met Jesus face to face. I went off to college and I went in and got into about everything you could possibly get into uh, for a person who didn't follow Jesus. And I remember the day my sister called me and said, Greg, Jesus is real. She continued to tell me her story of meeting Jesus, being delivered from amazing things and a life totally transformed by God's grace and power. But at that time in my life, I was not ready to surrender. I still loved the world and the things that I did. But my sister harassed me, lovingly, of course, with the gospel. 
She was the one who was always praying for me, loving me, sharing with me about Jesus, even when I didn't want to hear it. Finally, we met face to face, 4th of July weekend, 2010. And she cornered me over chips and dip at our 4th of July party. And she put her finger in my chest and said, Greg, it's time that you meet Jesus. You know what, I was tired of her harassing me, and so I said, fine, I'll give you one prayer to prove that Jesus really is who he says he is, and when nothing happens, leave me alone. She smiled and said, okay. We went and sat down. My sister laid hands on me, began praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, and what she prayed was not gibberish. What she prayed was Hebrew. Hebrew, what is spoken right now in the nation of Israel. Hebrew, that the Old Testament of the Word of God is written in. My sister speaking fluent Hebrew, and because I know her and have relationship with her, I know that she doesn't know Hebrew, and I'm afraid. Right? What would you have done? All of a sudden, the presence of God comes into the room, and I begin to hear in my heart, Greg, it's me. I am the one that people taught you about. I am the Lord. I did die for you to pay the penalty for your sin. I know how broken you are and how much you are lost. But if you come to me, I will give you life. Not because you have earned it, not because you have displayed any kind of righteousness on your own. I am going to do it because I am the Lord and I myself came to redeem the lost. That day, I surrendered my life to Jesus. I knew right away that I had a call to do in the kingdom of God. And like many of you, I prayed, God, what is that call? And the Lord impressed it on my heart to share this story that I just shared with you, with as many people as possible. Following the Lord on that journey led us here to this wonderful church. It led us back to the Pacific Northwest where we we were in ministry. And the the longer we followed Jesus, the more I knew that there was something else. I ended up traveling to this sensitive country in the Middle East in 2017, again a year later in 2018. And because there are no coincidences in the kingdom of God, I started praying, oh God, what are you doing? Please help me so that I can say yes to whatever it is that you are calling me to do. You see, when I met Jesus, it happened in the context of the American church, a place where the gospel is preached 24-7, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year, where you can turn on the radio, you can turn on the television, you can go online, and you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. A place where there are tens of thousands of amazing churches and millions of amazing Christians. But what about those areas where that does not exist? This country that I went to is one of those countries. As I traveled around, I started to learn that the things that they care about are equity, prostitution, abortion, gay pride, secularism, humanism, materialism. These are the things that they run after. A community that is so under threat of their neighbors around them that there is this feeling of fear all around, wherever you go, fear and hopelessness. They do not know when the next attack will happen when they themselves or someone they love will be injured or lost. A place that is greater than 99.75% unreached. That means the vast majority right now are continuing life. And when they die without Jesus, they will be eternally separated from God. So I started praying, God, why am I here? Why did you send me here? Why are you showing me their hearts? Why are you showing me their, their, their brokenness? Why wouldn't you just leave me alone in Oregon, where I was doing amazing ministry and seeing fruit? Why are you doing this in my life? God answered my question quickly. I heard a story about persecution that had happened that ultimately led to the, the loss of a, of a nine-year-old boy and a seven-year-old boy whose parents decided to follow Jesus. And then here's the hard part. When the workers offered to get them escape and asylum in the United States and Europe, they said, no, put us on a taxi and send us back to our village. They said, well, wait, wait, wait. If you go back to your village, they're going to take your life. You're going to suffer. You might even die. And they said, we know, but we have counted the cost. We are the only people who follow Jesus in our village. If they are to hear about the knowledge of the truth, how will they unless we go to them? So I'm walking down the hill and I'm stressed because I feel the Lord saying, Greg, if I asked you to do that, would you do it? My spirit said, yes. My flesh said, no, absolutely not. I like my freedom. I like my prosperity. I like seeing fruitful ministry. I don't want to volunteer for suffering. What about you? 
got my cup of coffee and I'm praying, God, I'm sorry for how I feel. If you, if you really want me to come, speak to my heart. At that moment, a young local woman came and roughly went by me, elbow, elbowing me in the ribs and running over my toes with her baby stroller. I looked up frustrated at her and complaining to the Lord, you know, what's wrong with these people, right? And he says, look again at that, at that young woman and look into her baby stroller. I did. The Lord said, what do you see? I said, well, I, don't know, I see a baby. And he said, that's right, Greg, you see a baby. I tell you the truth, that baby is going to grow up and not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if she doesn't hear about it, how can she place her faith in it? I tell you the truth, she will perish unless someone goes and tells her. Church, I have baby girls. I have baby boys. And I tell them about Jesus every single day. I show it to them in my weakness and brokenness when God comes in power and moves. I show it to them by the way that I live my life. But that little girl right now walking around this little village in this far to, hard to reach place, she's walking around. And she doesn't have mom and dad to tell her about Jesus. She does not have grandma and grandpa. She does not have witness. Do you think the Lord wants her in his kingdom? It is for this reason that we have said yes to go, to live amongst this unreached people, to spend our lives praying that God would lead us people to share the message of hope through Jesus with, to love, to serve, to even suffer with, if that's the case, so that they can have the opportunity to know Jesus as Lord. Will you send us to do that? But secondly, Will you pray and ask God, what are you calling me to do in my life? Will you pray that prayer? And will you say yes to him when he lays that call on your heart? I ask you to join me in a prayer for Greg. Rosanna, do you mind coming up? She's like, I'm not going to talk. I heard the children. Um, but you're a great herder seen it all morning. Greg and Rosanna have four kids, so if, if you remember them from when they uh, were serving with us, their twins, Joel and Lily, were born, and then they moved just a, a couple months after that, so now they're six years old, yeah, and uh, they've had a couple more since then, so uh, we're praying for Greg and Rosanna as they go. If you want to find out exactly where they're going, what they're doing, please stop by the, the table in the foyer, but I'm going to ask you, will you please join me in a prayer for them? Lord, we thank you for Greg and Rosanna. We thank you that they have said yes. Lord, they've heard your call and they have responded to it. They're willing to uh, take their family into new experiences, into difficult places, to endure uh, difficult ministry. And Lord, we pray that they would serve by the power of your spirit. We ask that daily their hearts would be bound to you, that Greg and Rosanna's hearts would be bound to each other. We pray your protection over their hearts, over their marriage, over their children, Lord. We pray that as they go, even now, Lord, we believe you're arranging divine appointments, Holy Spirit-inspired conversations and relationships. Lord, we believe the neighbors that live next to them, the families they play with in the park, the people they interact with in business, in everywhere they go and everything they do, Lord, you are preparing the way for them to share the gospel. So, Lord, we pray that uh, you would give them favor as they're finishing up uh, their process of raising partnerships so they can go, that it would go quickly, it would go efficiently, Lord, and they would be able to go and begin doing the work that you've called them to do. We thank you that we get to be part of it, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us individually about how we can go, how we can give, how we can pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg and Rosanna. Appreciate you guys. This morning, we can uh, partner with Greg and Rosanna in our giving. You can go to christianchapel.com slash give and just select them in the drop-down box. That will go entirely to help them get on the way. We are also adding them to our monthly support through our Kingdom Builders Giving, so we'll have an ongoing partnership with them as well. If you prefer to give in person, you can do that on your way out this morning, or the ushers will be happy to bring you an offering envelope right now. Uh, you can designate that gift. Uh, just write Greg on there, uh, Greg and Rosanna, Live Dead, any of those combinations, tall guy. Uh, and we'll make sure it gets to them this morning. You can drop that in the buckets by either door on your way out. At this time, we want to dismiss our first through sixth graders. Pastor Amy is over there and has a great experience planned for you guys. Parents, if it's your first time, you're welcome to accompany your child so you can see where you'll pick them up afterwards. The rest of us, if you'll turn your attention to the screens, we have a few announcements about some uh, things that are coming up at Christian Chapel, and then we'll jump into our Lazarus series. Welcome to Christian Chapel. We are so glad you're with us this morning. If you are a guest, 
please stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. We have a gift for you. If you have any questions about who we are, what we do, or how you can get involved, our guest services team will be happy to help you. Now for this week's announcements. A new session of adult discipleship groups is underway. Join us at church on Wednesday nights for a family dinner at 5.30 and groups begin at 7. You can check out a list of all the groups at christianchapel.com forward slash Wednesday nights. What's up, my Christian Chapel family? It's your boy, Pastor K, and I'm the youth pastor here at Christian Chapel. Listen, I want to give you guys some exciting news. This year, we are having youth camp at Sparks, Oklahoma. You can sign up at christianchapel.com forward slash youth camp. Youth camp will take place this year on June 21st through June 25th. Be there or be square. Don't forget to sign up. See ya. Peace. Home groups meet this evening from 6 to 8. Chapel kids and chapel youth D groups will meet here on campus. To join a home group, visit the Welcome Center or check out the list of groups on christianchapel.com forward slash groups. You can email the leaders to get details about their particular group. Hey Christian Chapel, Sunday, April 25th is Staff Pastor Appreciation. It's our day to say thank you to Chris Godfrey, Kareem Katia, Amy Byler, and Lauren Gankars for their dedicated and faithful service to us. We'll take some time in both of our services to recognize and honor them. We'll also have a basket available to collect your cards of thanks and appreciation. You can bring those with you and drop them off before or after each service. Thank you for helping me express our deep appreciation to this wonderful group of pastors that God has blessed our church with. Hey everybody, just want to remind you all that Graduation Sunday will happen on May 2nd this year. If you are graduating, please email pam at christianchapel.com so we can celebrate you this year as you graduate. We love you guys. Take care. That's all for this week. For more information about how you can get involved in our church family, visit the Welcome Center or go to christianchapel.com. Thanks again for choosing to spend part of your week here with us at Christian Chapel. Right, today is week seven of our Lazarus Life series. We're working through the story of Lazarus from John chapter 11 and 12. Uh, so if you are just joining us, kind of to, to catch you up, the story of Lazarus is a story about a man that Jesus knows, seems to have a friendship with. Lazarus gets sick, uh, sick to the point of death, to where his sisters, Martha and Mary, send a messenger to Jesus. And their concern is that Jesus will show up and obviously make a difference for them. And so what we've explored uh, each week through this series is just some of the common questions that Lazarus' story brings up for us of why do bad things happen to good people? Um, why doesn't Jesus always act the way we want him to act in the time that we want him to act? What do we do when Jesus asks us to do things that don't necessarily make sense? What do we do when Jesus shows up and reveals who he is, but we don't quite understand it? And as we're asking these questions, we're finding the answers. And, and what we've really seen is the story of Lazarus is really the story of the gospel in a nutshell. It's a story of our problems, our difficulties, how they all ultimately will lead to death without Jesus. But when Jesus shows up, there's always a promise of resurrection. There's always the promise of new life. And so today we're going to pick up the story and see what it teaches us about how we experience Jesus when life hurts, right? And, and so just, again, to, to catch up where we are, Lazarus has died. Jesus, it seems like, did not show up on time. He, he finally heads back to Bethany after Lazarus has died. He winds up on the outskirts of town. Martha, the older sister of Lazarus, knows that Jesus is coming somehow, so she runs out to meet him. That's where we left the story last week with Jesus' promise to Martha, your brother will rise again because I am the resurrection and the life. And we saw that Martha thinks, yeah, one day he will, and Jesus is trying to teach her, no, this day he will. And so as that interaction ends, Martha runs back into town because Jesus wants to see Mary. And that's where we're going to pick up the story this morning. So if you have your Bible, it'll be John chapter 11. We'll start in verse 28. If not, it'll be here on the screens for you. So after Martha has confessed to Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God come into the world. It says, after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Now, as I said, today we're going to talk about what this story teaches us about how Jesus responds and how we experience him when life hurts. And, and probably the first thing we have to acknowledge is um, pain, death, discomfort, suffering. It makes us all pretty uncomfortable, right? There aren't very many. How many of you, when you see someone crying that you don't know, think, I want to go talk to them? Anybody? I mean, it's okay. I know there's some of you, like you are kind-hearted, right? You're, you've got the counselor spirit, and you're awesome, and we need that. Most of us see it, right? And it's kind of like, oh, I'm sure they'll be fine, right? And, and, and you just go along your day, right? If I, well, I'd probably make it worse. I don't really want to go into it, right? What's, what's one of the most common things we hear from someone when they have a, a friend or a family member suffering a significant loss or, or experiencing a, a massive difficulty? It's, it's this idea of, I, I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to them. I don't know how. And, and so for many of us, our response to our discomfort is just to stay away from it. Right? And, and usually the only way we get over that is to go through some difficult season ourselves. And then because we've been there, we're more comfortable approaching others and saying, hey, I know where you are. I know what you're going through. It's okay. Right? And, and, and you kind of learn. You don't have to have all the answers. You can just be present. But, but for many of us, that discomfort remains even if we've been through it. And, and the sad part is sometimes we take that discomfort and we apply it to Jesus. And we think, well, if I'm uncomfortable when other people are hurting, if I don't really like entering into the, the tears and the questions and the doubts, then maybe Jesus is the same. And we, we begin to adopt this false picture of him. Like, you know, he is, he's kind of this too holy to be dirtied kind of God. It's like, hey, I, I, I see you, but if, if you can compose yourself, I would like to help you. But I'm going to need you to pull it together a bit first, right? We picture Jesus like a, a parent with their toddler who's just, have you ever, you, have you seen the toddler in full meltdown mode? <laughs> right? Where they just can't get the word out. And, just, and, and what do parents say? Like, hey, 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 I can't understand you. Calm down. Use your words, right? And, and we're, we're trying, and, and I think sometimes we carry that view of God of he's just there like, hey, hey, pull it together a bit. Let's compose ourselves, and then I'll come. But, but what's really interesting is the, the interactions we see between Jesus and Martha and Mary, right? And, and what we see is that when life hurts, Jesus moves towards us. And so, so Martha comes to Jesus, and Martha is the composed one. She comes and, and she expresses her frustration, but it seems she does it in a very kind of put-together way. Martha is a typical older child, right, of just, hey, she has read the birth order book. She knows what's expected of her. She's going to behave in that way, and she's going to show up, and she's, she's mourning. She's grieving. It doesn't mean she doesn't hurt, but she's going to kind of hold it together and be like, hey, Jesus, um, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus interacts with her, and they, they have this little moment. He moves towards her, but Jesus almost instantly notices, where's Mary? Like, Mary's always hanging around. Mary always wants to be with me. Like, Martha, last time I was here, you got mad at Mary for not working because she just kept listening to me teach, and yet now I'm here, and Mary doesn't come. But Jesus isn't frustrated. He's not aggravated. It's not, hey, what's wrong with Mary? Instead, he tells Martha, go get Mary go get her. And it's this really beautiful illustration for us of in our pain, in our suffering, even if we won't move towards Jesus, Jesus will move towards us. 
right? You, you're here this morning. You might be in a, a low spot. You might be in a difficult season, and you're thinking, you know what I really need? I really need someone to come and tell me that God is with me. I really need a sign that he sees me. And, and I uh, say this with humility, but also with confidence. I am your sign today. God sees you he knows you. He loves you. You are listening to this scripture because he wants you to understand no matter your doubts, your questions, your aggravations, or frustrations, he is moving toward you in your pain. He's not waiting for you to get it right. He's not waiting for you to pull it together. He's not waiting for you to discover the answers on your own. He is coming towards you. And not only is he coming towards you, but he's calling you out. And so he goes to Martha and he says, hey, go get Mary. Martha goes back home and says, Mary, the teacher is calling for you. Right? And, and then Mary models the response that you and I should have of when we find out Jesus is moving towards us. So this morning when you hear Jesus is moving towards you in your pain, your response should be, yes, thank you. And then begin to move towards him. Not just sitting there saying, well, I'm just going to stay here and do the same things I've always done. I'm going to be a prisoner in my grief. I'm going to be isolated in my pain. And if Jesus really wants to do something, he can come pry me out of this mess. But begin to move towards him. So for Mary, that means she gets up from where she is and she goes out to Jesus. For you and I, it might mean we get up from where we are and we walk back to a prayer room this morning. It might mean we get up from where we are and we make the phone call to a friend. It might mean we get up from where we are and we open our Bible for the first time in months today. It might mean we get up physically from where we are later in this service and we begin to sing songs of worship to the Lord. There is usually a physical response that accompanies a spiritual response. So Mary gets up from where she is. She goes out to Jesus. And, and, and I love the difference in Mary and Martha's grief because I think it kind of covers all of us. Martha goes in her grief and she's composed. Mary comes and it says, she falls at his feet and she's weeping. And she's just weeping and crying out. And where Martha had expressed, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary is the toddler of getting it out between heaves and sobs and saying the exact same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But from both Mary and Martha, what we learn is no matter how we grieve, Jesus is there. And no matter how we grieve, Jesus has a plan. And then uh, John goes on to describe Jesus' response in a, a really interesting way that I think is worth our attention this morning. So in verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now, there's a, a Greek verb there, that one word that gets translated into this phrase, deeply moved in spirit and troubled. This is the, the NIV translation of it, and, and most scholars agree that this translation loses some of the power of what John is actually describing. Right? And, and we can understand why, and, and we'll kind of explain that in just a moment, why they maybe chose this phrase. But in classical Greek, the phrase that is used here is the same word used to describe the snort of a horse before it goes into war or begins a race. Right? And it's, it's used throughout the New Testament to describe fury, outrage, or anger. And so you can read all kinds of New Testament scholars, and what they'll tell you is the better translation of this verse is Jesus was outraged in spirit and troubled. The word indicates an outburst of anger. He's outraged at the deepest level of his being. So perhaps a better understanding is when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was outraged. Now we can understand why perhaps the NIV chose, you know, deeply moved in spirit and troubled because they're trying to communicate this idea of Jesus felt it and there was an emotional response, but they don't want to communicate the idea that he's angry at you when you suffer or he's angry at you when you mourn. That's not at all what is going on here, right? So, so don't read it that way. This is not, like when I was growing up, one of my dad's favorite phrases uh, when I was crying was to tell me, dry it up, right? <laughs> dry it up, not gonna, dry it up. We're not, you know, we, Angie and I, we've translated that to, you're fine, right? That's what we tell our kids. They're crying, hey, you're fine, you're fine, right? It's just like a kinder, gentler, it's a, it's a 2020 dry it up, right? It's, uh, you know, because we're always better parents than our parents were, we think, until our kids grow up and let us know we're not. But uh, any, anyways, right? So it's, it's that, some of us, if it, was, if it just said Jesus was outraged, some of us would go back to that of like, oh, 
So he doesn't want to see my tears. He doesn't want to hear my cries. He doesn't want to enter into that pain. But that's not what it is. This is not your dad saying, dry it up. It's not your mom telling you, you're fine. It's not a friend saying, get over it. Instead, what is happening here is John chooses this word to make the point very clear to us that Jesus hates the pain that sin and death cause people he loves. He's outraged. When Jesus looks at the things that that are causing you to suffer, his response is outrage. He can't believe it. He can't take it. Now, if there's a word that we understand in 2021, it's outrage, right? We're outraged all the time about everything. Some of you are like, no, I'm not. You are. I'm friends with you on social media. I don't say it. I know, but you share it. I see it, right? You see the retweets. You see the repost. You see the, just posting this for you to consider, uh, whatever you want to say. It's outrage. And when we get outraged, it's because we see something in the world that causes us to be deeply moved in our spirit and troubled by it. The difference between Jesus and us is when Jesus is outraged, He can behave in ways that he doesn't have to ask for forgiveness for, right? Which I don't know about you, but I don't always. I mean, there there have been a lot of times I've had to send some follow-up emails, texts, and conversations of, hey, I'm sorry. My passion got the best of me. I know it sounded like I was yelling, but I was really explaining was what I was doing, you know? And and we have those those moments of like, ah, sorry. The, The other difference, though. Is there, I get outraged a lot of times about things that I have absolutely no ability to control, right? Spaces where I have no voice, places where I have no power. But here's the difference with Jesus. When Jesus is outraged, he can always do something about it. And so, so what we actually learn from the scriptures is that as Jesus is entering into this season and or this moment and he sees Mary is weeping, And everyone with her is weeping. He's outraged in his spirit, not at their tears, but at the cause of their tears. That they're experiencing the suffering, this pain, this loss, this grief. And he knows this is not how the world is supposed to be. This is the result of sin. This is what happens when men and women willfully and joyfully choose to be their own gods instead of surrendering their lives to God. Death itself is the permanent result of sin in our bodies. Jesus is outraged by it, but he also comes as the answer to his outrage. In that moment, he knows this is not the way it's supposed to be, but he also knows, and I'm going to change it. I'm going to take care of it, not just when he goes to the cemetery and calls Lazarus out of the grave, but when he goes to the cross and takes care of it for us once and for all. See, Jesus isn't outraged from a distance, but he actually comes down and he enters right into the middle of it. And so what we want to remember, even as we're working through the story of Lazarus, and even in a moment where we'll get to the idea of Jesus weeps with us, is he never comes just to sympathize, but he comes to solve. He comes to make a difference in your pain, in your suffering, and in your loss. This is what separates Jesus from every other religious figure, every other mythical story about God, is he is not a God at a distance, but he's the God who comes down. He's the God not who says, here's the way out of suffering, but the God who enters into suffering with us. In fact, in Isaiah 53, we see some of the prophecies of Jesus, and in addition to, you know, really exalting him and lift him up, they also show how he's going to come down and he's going to enter into the mess. If you have a Bible, you can read later in Isaiah 53, verse 2. It says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. When Jesus stands on the outskirts of Bethany, he doesn't stand as someone who's unfamiliar with pain and sorrow. 
And when Jesus comes to you in the middle of your pain, he's not coming as a distant God who says, I don't know what you're feeling, but I would like to help you. Instead, he comes as the one who not only has suffered in every way just as we do, but he comes as the one who takes all of our suffering on himself, who says he will be pierced for our transgressions, he will be crushed for our iniquities. The punishment for our sins will be placed on him. And he will give us peace and healing. See, Jesus doesn't come with his outrage and just kind of say, I can't stand this. There's got to be a different way. But his outrage on the outskirts of Bethany is what will lead him to the outrageous display of love on the cross. I mean, think think of it maybe this way. When when Jesus comes to sympathize, he doesn't just show up with a Kleenex and say, here, let let me wipe your tears. But he shows up with a cross and says, let me solve every problem that makes you weep. Let me show you a path to new life. And it's not going to be a path of removal from pain and suffering. It's going to be a path of taking it all on himself and defeating the underlying cause of every tear, every doubt, every grief, every season of loss, every aggravation, every frustration. Jesus's outrage causes him to be the answer. This is what separates him, again, from every other religious leader figure in history. It's not just, here's a set of religious principles, you should try to apply them to your life and see how it goes. It's not just, here are seven ways to endure grief, or here are eight ways to exchange depression for joy. It's, here is the God who suffers, and here is the way he's won victory over it all, and leads you through it all. John Stott is a, was an English uh, pastor and theologian. And he, he was a brilliant man who wrote a lot about the, the place of suffering, the place of the cross as God's answer to suffering, and how that changes the way we experience pain. I want to share with you a, a little extended passage from him. Stott says, In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha. His legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed. The ghost of a smile playing round his mouth. A remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time after a while, I've had to turn away. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails through hands and feet. Back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. And Stott says, that is God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross, which symbolizes divine suffering. What Stott is trying to help us understand is Jesus comes and in the cross he bears the full weight of all of our suffering. Whether it's my fault, your fault, someone else's fault. It's just the result of living in a fallen and sinful world. It's what Isaiah prophesied. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Right? It was placed on him and he answered it for us. And in the cross, he answered it once and for all. But he doesn't just die the sacrificial death so that we can look and say he suffers with us. But as we talked about last week, he is also the resurrection and the life. And the fact that he dies and rises again is God teaching us he suffers with you. He's with you in the lowest moment and he promises resurrection from it. That the experience of doubt, the experience of grief, the experience of pain is not permanent. There is a promise of another tomorrow. Joy will return. Hope will be restored. Right? And, and this is where we live, in between the first resurrection and the final resurrection. And we know some of these pains won't be dealt with until the final resurrection. But we know they will be. And that's why we have hope. That's why we keep going. So what that means for us then is if Jesus not only identifies with our pain, but he's solved our pain then it means we can invite him into our pain. 
So he's deeply outraged and troubled. And then what's his first response? He says to Mary and the Jews who were there, where have you laid him? I mean, what's he asking? He's saying, where's Lazarus? Where is he? Now, Jesus, he he knows where he is. He knows he's in the tomb. He knows he's dead. But Jesus actually wants them to say it, and he wants them to show him. And he comes to us in the same way. In seasons of pain, seasons of suffering, seasons of loss, he's saying, hey, where is it? Where does it hurt? Where's the cause of it? And and again, culturally, many of us have learned to disguise or to hide our pain. We don't want to talk about the diagnosis. We don't want to reveal the actual state of the marriage. We don't tell stories about the kid who's making poor choices. We don't unveil the actual state of our finances. We don't talk about the true state of our soul. We don't uncover the real addictions that have us bound. And even in church, we learn to give religious answers, and we learn how to maybe not lie but not tell the whole truth. We learn how to say things like, you know what, I'm doing well. There's some places that that I need God to work. Oh, yeah, what are those places? Like a relationship. I mean, we're as good as anyone can be. Finances. uh, You know, we could always use a little more. Your health. I don't want to complain. And we've got all of these ways that, that what are we doing? We're basically setting up a barrier to another person or to God and saying, let's not go there. Let's not get into that. We'll get into this more in a couple weeks when Jesus shows up at the grave and tells him, roll back the stone. Martha's like, no, Lord, it stinks. Right? And, and that, we'll, we'll just stop there because that, that'll, be, that'll, be, that'll be too fun for today. So, uh, but, but today what we're going to think is, is Jesus turns to him and he says, where have you laid him? I see the results. I see your tears. I feel your grief. But where's the problem? Jesus, here's what we got to understand. Jesus never enters into your life just to treat the symptoms. He always comes for the underlying issue, right? So, so in your marriage, it's not, I need to be nicer to my spouse. It's, there's some stuff deep in your heart that needs to be rooted out. There's some anger and bitterness. There's some unmet expectations. There's some places where maybe you're putting a weight on them that they could never carry. And what God is coming, he's saying, hey, let's actually go there. Show me the real problem. Let's talk about the real issue. Let's get right down into it. Jesus wants you to walk him to the cemetery, to point at the tomb, and to say, this is what it is. It's this person. It's that situation. It's this dream that never happened. It's this doubt that I have. It's this addiction I can't get over. Right? It's this underlying disbelief that God could really forgive me and cleanse me and renew me. It's, it's this trauma from my childhood that I have never told anyone about, and it's affected every relationship I've had since then. He's saying, look, take me to the point of death. Why? Because he's the resurrection and the life. But he only resurrects dead things. And it requires the acknowledgement on our part of, look, I might have tried to cover it, I might have tried to conceal it, but when Jesus says, where have you laid it? We have to respond like Mary and the mourners with her, and they just say, come and see. Come and see, Lord. And they begin to walk from where they are, and they head to the cemetery. Our eternal response when Jesus moves towards us in our pain should be to say to him, come and see. Come and let me tell you the whole story. Come and sit down in the grief with me. Come and let me point you to the moment in my history where everything changed. Come and let me show you the disappointment that still makes me angry. Come and let me show you the betrayal of another person that has closed my heart off to authentic relationships. Come and let me show you the dream I thought you had given me, Lord, that has not come to pass and all the anger and frustration that goes with it. Come and let me show you all the places I feel like I've been overlooked, I've been forgotten, I've been neglected. Come and let me show you this. And here's the beauty of the story. Jesus asks so that you will invite. And when you invite, he he just gladly goes with you. But he goes with a plan, and he goes with a promise. And his promise is in every space you take him to. He is resurrection, and he is life. 
And I think that's really some of our fear, is I'm afraid if I actually open this door in my heart, this door in my relationship, this door in my career, this, this door in my sin, I'm afraid if I take Jesus there, he's not going to be able to do anything about it. I'm afraid we're going to show up and he's going to be like, oh, didn't see that coming. All right, I'm afraid if I say, Lord, here's what's really in my heart, that he's going to look at me and be like, you know what, you are the worst. I've never seen anyone as bad as you. Why do you, you promised me a long time ago you were going to stop doing this. Remember you said if you didn't do it, I, you would never get married and you'd live alone as a hermit or you'd be a missionary and you, have, you haven't done any of that. Right? That's, what, that's what we're really afraid of. We're afraid we're going to show Jesus a mess and because, because that's our experience that we've had with other people. If we've taken the step and we've been open and we've been honest, we've been authentic and they've been repulsed, and they've distanced themselves from us. Or maybe because that's how we've treated others when they've asked us, hey, come and see. And we've, we've looked and said, I don't need to get any closer to that. I can't help you. And we've withdrawn, so we've just become convinced that there are spaces in our heart where resurrection and life are not possible. But what Jesus is trying to help us understand in the story of Lazarus is even the spaces where it looks completely over he still wants to go there. You might be divorced and your, your ex-spouse is remarried and there's no hope of that thing ever being revived again, but Jesus still wants to go there with you. And he still wants to speak words of life and comfort. Or you might be like Martha and Mary taking him to a cemetery. For some of you this week, it might be a grief you've never dealt with. And, and so what you're going to do is you're physically going to get in the car and you're going to drive to the cemetery and you're going to stand there and you're going to say, here it is, Lord. This is where the pain resides. This is the place I've been afraid to bring you to. But whatever it is and whatever we're going through, what we're learning is as we go there, Jesus has a plan. Right, but, but as you read the story, his first response when they say come and see is not Lazarus come out. But his first response, it says in verse 35, is Jesus wept. So they, 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 it's just kind of this moment of like, but wait, I thought you were outraged about my tears, but now you're crying as well. What's going on here? And now, now the terms that are used are a little different, right? When Martha and, or when Mary and the other mourners show up and they're weeping, it's this more kind of boisterous wailing and weeping. It's a, a cultural expectation, actually. Some families would hire professional mourners to make sure that the dead were actually honored in an appropriate way. And so that's the experience when Mary and the mourners come to Jesus. But when Jesus weeps, he's not weeping as those others are weeping. He's not one without hope, but he is displaying compassion, sympathy, he is entering and he's doing what Paul will later tell us to do in Romans chapter 12, to mourn with those who mourn. Jesus' tears are a reminder to us that when life is bad, even though he's outraged and he has a plan for it and he's dealt with it all, he doesn't do it from afar. But he still comes in. So you might have got the diagnosis. And, and Jesus sees it and he has a plan for it. But as you're weeping over the diagnosis, he doesn't come in and just say, hey, lift your chin up, dry your tears, let's go. But almost every single time before Jesus reveals his plan, he affirms his love. And lets us know, hey, I'm, I'm with you. I know that's terrible, and I'm with you in it. I know that's painful, and I feel that with you. Jesus is, what, what he's really teaching us here is, is even when you know how the story ends, you can still cry at the sad parts. Right? He's not crying because Lazarus is dead, because he knows that's about to be over. He knows Lazarus will rise again, not in decades or millennium, but now. In a few moments, you're going to watch him walk out of that grave. Jesus' tears are just because the people he loves are sad. He identifies with them in their suffering, and his outrage not only leads him to the cross, but it also leads him to weep. Where are my, where are my movie criers? Anybody? Be honest. There you go. Okay. There you go. How many of you have ever cried watching a movie that you've seen before? Okay. All right. 
How many of you, uh, there are certain movies you cry every single time? Okay, yeah, right? So I, I don't know what those will be for you. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Old Yeller. <laughs> right? Every time. No, don't do it. Give him a rabies shot. There's hope. Right? Maybe it's Rudy. Runs out of the tunnel, gets that first sack. You're just like, it is dusty in here. <laughs> Maybe it's Saving Private Ryan right at the cemetery. He turns to his wife, tell me I'm a good man. Ugh. Maybe it's those social media videos that you see on Facebook or Instagram of, of the deployed parent who surprises their child at school or the ball. I mean, come on. Are you like, <laughs> I, I don't cry at movies, but those will get me every time. Kids are like, Dad, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Leave the room, please. You know, but well, what happens? Those of you especially, if, if you've seen the movie four, five, six, ten times, and you still cry, especially the movie where you know it turns out good in the end, like there is that Cinderella comes out of the tower, but you're still crying when she smashes the slipper. Right, why, why do we do that? We do that because we identify with the character. Because we feel the pain with them in that moment. And we have put ourselves in the story. Right? And, and so for, for a movie, it means that, hey, there's, there's some writers and actors that have done a great job. But in the gospel, what it means is Jesus, he doesn't just identify with your story, but he identifies with your heart. He sees it and he chooses to feel it with you. This is what Stott explained when he was describing the cross. He said, God gave up his immunity to pain. When he came to be like us, he was choosing to suffer. He was choosing to be rejected. He was choosing to be held in low esteem. He was choosing to be afflicted. He was choosing to be the punishment that brought us peace. He was choosing to have all of our iniquity, all of our sin laid on him. Jesus chose all of that. And what we're reminded of is even though he knows how our story ends, even though he looks at your life this morning and says, hey, resurrection is coming. New life is possible, both here and forever. Even as he does that, he still weeps with you because he loves you and because you're hurting. So what that means for us is Jesus' tears remind us that we never have to live in a way where we act like sad things aren't sad or painful things don't hurt. We don't have to buy into the lies of, man, I, if, if I say what's wrong with me, it's like I'm giving it power. No, you're just acknowledging what's wrong with you. Right? When Jesus says, show me where you laid him, Mary doesn't respond of like, Lord, we don't, we don't want to say he's dead because then, then he might be dead. Lazarus is dead. Doesn't matter what they say, where they go, what they do, how they talk about it, he is dead. And in your life, there are some dead places. In your life, there are some spaces where addiction is strong. In your life, there are places where sickness is real, where relational trauma is being experienced. And when Jesus looks at you and says, take me to it, you don't have to hold back of like, I don't want to say it, I don't want to confess it, I don't want to give it power. Because he sees it and he knows it. And he's just saying, look, look, just take me there. I'm the resurrection and the life. The words that you speak over the reality of your situation are not stronger than the word Jesus intends to speak when he shows up there. All right? Life, healing, freedom, forgiveness, redemption, restoration. He shows up and says, I'm going to make it all new. And so we can confidently say, Lord, this is where I am and this is where I'm going through. And so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna invite you in and I'm gonna trust that you have a plan because I don't know what else to do. All right, I've been trying to manage this. I've been trying to deal with it. I've been trying to dress it up, but Lord, it's just getting worse. So will you come? And then at the very end of the story, we see the response of some of the crowd there. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? See, they take the pain as proof of God's absence. They don't think that Jesus' love is compatible with suffering. 
But what we're supposed to be learning in this process is God loves us even when we suffer. He loves us even in our darkest hour. He is moving towards us. And so our pain is not a sign of God's absence, but it's the space where we're going to experience resurrection life. So you don't have to be afraid to talk about it. You don't have to be afraid to acknowledge it. You don't have to be afraid to go back to the prayer room this morning and say, look, life is terrible and I'm going to tell you why. And the response of those people praying with you is going to be the same as the response of Jesus of, hey, let's just go see. And let's believe that resurrection and life are possible. We stand with me. I want to pray for you. The band's going to come back and they'll lead us in a final song today. Lord, we come aware of our needs. And we come today extremely grateful that your outrage has led you to action. Jesus, we come to thank you for the cross. We thank you for suffering as we have suffered and more. We thank you for taking on yourself the consequences of all of our sin. We thank you for taking our pain, our sorrow, our grief. Thank you for taking all the ways that life has not went how we wanted it to go. Lord, and as you've taken those on yourself and you've dealt with them on the cross, we now come to receive your offer of new life. We come to be people of resurrection, people of life, people who know not only are you with us, but you're leading us through and you're leading us out. So Lord, I pray for each person in this room, each person online, you see the places where we're suffering, where we're hurting, we're weeping. And we pray today that we would know you are near and we would know you have made provision for us in this space. Lord, give us the courage to say to you, come and see. Come and see my pain, come and see my hurt, come and see my grief. Come and see the spaces where none of it makes sense. And Lord, as you come and see, will you come and act? Will you come and intervene? Will you come and save? Will you come and deliver? Will you come and heal? Lord, I pray today as we extend that invitation to you to come into our pain, that we would receive your invitation to come into your kingdom, to be your sons and your daughters, to be those who are loved by you and cared for by you. Jesus, we surrender to your presence in these moments. In your name we pray, amen, amen. If you'd like someone to join with you about specific pain points in your life, spaces where you need them to act, head out those back doors and to your left. Our prayer team's waiting to pray those prayers with you. The rest of us, we're going to sing a final song. It's just a, a reminder of where our hope and our faith reside. My life is built on your faithfulness. My hope is held in your promises. I take each step with your confidence. Because I am yours. I am yours. You never fail. You never will. I'll trust your name for greater things. You will come through. You always do. I'll trust your name for greater In the wilderness You brought me back From my brokenness You took my shame And you buried it What you've done I won't forget Oh, you never fail Thank you.
I'll see this fight from the victory. Yeah. No power of hell stand against me. Cause I've seen this fight from the victory. How will I feel? How will I feel? go today, my prayer is you go with that assurance in your soul that he will never fail, he has never failed, so you can confidently open up every space in your heart, every space in your life, believing God has a plan, that he is present, he's active, he's working, he's revealing it to you. So as you go today, may you go in his grace and peace, may you go with an assurance of his love, his comfort, may you know that he not only sympathizes with you, but he has solved all the underlying causes. Thank you for worshiping him.